So, thank you ever so much for uh, joining us uh, this morning, and uh, thanks ever so much for clicking on to this, our very first uh, Cancer Care uh, podcast. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Lisa Gallagher, who will be having a conversation with me uh, this morning. And uh, we really hope that this will be a informative and interesting uh, conversation for you all to, to listen and perhaps even watch. Um, this is our first uh, podcast at Cancer Care West, so this is new territory. We're going to be sorting out little glitches in terms of technology and the smoothness of things as we as we go. But um, hopefully, as we as we kind of get more used to doing these, um, they're going to be uh, sharper and, and 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 better as we as we as we kind of go along. So we'd be more than happy for you to to sort of join us along the journey and um, please subscribe as well if uh, if this is a content is of interest to you. Um, and as I say, I'm, uh, we're very, very glad that uh, Lisa has uh, agreed to, to join us this morning. And uh, as I say, we hope we have a, a lovely, informative and, and uh, co interesting uh, conversation this morning. So Lisa, thanks ever so much. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Um, it's really gracious, I think, really, of you to, to kind of come and, uh, and speak with us uh, today. No, oh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. You're more than welcome. More than welcome. So I, I guess to kick off, maybe there, there are people who will know you from your uh, previous public uh, life, I suppose, in, in Ireland's uh, fittest family, uh, a finalist, I, I, I understand, as well. Yeah, that's right. I made the final four. <laughs> made the final four. Wow. Um, so people may know you in that capacity. Um, but can you tell us a little bit, little bit more about, about yourself and, and maybe particularly about the recent head shave that you did uh, raising money for us and for, uh, I think, another charity as well. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I previously worked in a preschool as a manager before I got my diagnosis. And diagnosis led then to two operations and then on to chemo. So... Once I knew I was having chemo, obviously the side effect is, you know, hair loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone had mentioned to me, why don't you do it for a fundraiser? So I was kind of toying with it and thinking about it. And so after my first chemo, you know, you have a shower and then sort of clumps of hair starts coming out and, you know, on your pillow and you just find a hair. And I thought, do you know, I just think I would rather take control of this. Yeah. And... Yeah also then to put a positive spin on it to raise money so I was actually thought I had um, already been to the service here and just to meet people here and I hadn't started my reflexology then and I just loved the feeling when I came in here it was just such a lovely atmosphere mm. and what was I thought, that like what was that like when you came in actually what was that like it was I came in with my mum we just happened to just be driving past and with my dad right. and we left my dad in the car and me and my mum came up just to see what kind of um, services that you offer and we came in and we were offered a cup of tea and we sat and we chatted and then we remembered my dad was still in the car <laughs> but uh, it was just right. just felt so relaxed and I yeah. thought oh I just got a lovely feeling about here and I really feel that this is going to be somewhere I'm going to be coming quite often right. so anyway so going back then when I was thinking about the head shave yeah, I yeah clicked on to Cancer Care OS and thought, oh, it's easy to set up to, to the fundraiser because I thought yeah, I'm not yeah. very good with technical, you know, yeah, setting yeah. things up. And yeah. also the fact that all the money comes to the service, that was really important to me as well. Um, that Because some of the GoFundMe plays and different things, you know, you, you would lose a percentage. Yes. And that was really important that if someone's going to be um, donating money, that mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. goes to the service, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. really important to me. Yeah. So I was just laying in bed and clicked a few buttons and next thing I thought I set it up 200 and thought that's perfect. And I only gave myself about four days, I think, before I was actually getting my head shaved. And even like an hour later, it had gone past the 200 and I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that yeah. the time I kind of went to bed, it was nearly, a, a, you know, a thousand euros. Holy. I thought, I can't believe how generous yeah. people are and so kind. Yeah, and then... Yeah. 
my sister was saying, oh, they just want to see you with an egghead, <laughs> just to see your head shape. <laughs> so it actually kind of then... That's sisterly love yeah, for you, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so then I thought to myself, you know, I just felt good about doing it and it took away the nerves of actually going ahead. So it was probably a bit of a deterrent, really, and, and it just took my mind off actually having to go in and we'd booked uh, to get it done at Haircraft. This my kind of original um, hair salon that I'd always attended for years and uh, okay. arranged to go in there to get my hair shaved. Okay. And Julie was really kind. She's like, we'll close the salon for you so it can be done privately. And so she was really, she was really kind and set it up. And it's kind of VIP treatment. It, it was, it was, yeah, yeah it was yeah, lovely. Yeah. And then I was like, who or who do I invite? Obviously, I didn't really want to make it a big thing because I didn't know how I was going to feel on the day. Because, I, like, you think how awesome. you might feel, but I don't want to have a big crowd around me. And then I'm just going to be really, really kind of in bits. But obviously I need some support because it is going to be an emotional thing to do. Yeah. So yeah. I just invited uh, my family, my parents, my sister, and my children, and then just a couple of close friends to come along and to watch. And they did it. Yes, yes, yes they came. Yeah. So on the day then, so everybody came and tried to make a bit of a celebration as well. And there was tea and coffee and cakes and things. And um, yeah, but it was... Um, it's hard to kind of realise once the when you hear the razor go and how you how is it going to feel to see your hair come, it was it was very emotional, really emotional. Like and yeah, yeah, yeah. problem for me, obviously, I wear glasses, so I didn't have my glasses on, and I had my children there, but I couldn't see how upset they got because it obviously hit them hard. Yes. when that happened yes. but I wasn't aware because I couldn't see them in the mirror right okay and it wasn't until I looked at the photos and videos afterwards that I realized how distressing it was for the children as well and my oh, okay. all, all the family okay. you know okay, it yeah. was very tearful for them yeah 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 but I actually felt really kind of um liberated getting my hair shaved okay. I have to say okay. it, I actually found it a positive experience yes um, even though it was emotional for everybody to watch, but I actually felt I've taken control of this. Yes. You know, this is yes. my choice. Yes. To take my hair, you know, to get my hair shaven off, rather than every day losing more and more hair. So yeah. if somebody I else is going the, through the same you're thing... You're confronting something quite... Um, that can be intimidating, but you're voluntarily on your own volition confronting it. Yes, and I think for women as well, you know, their hair... You know, it, it, it's such a big part of them. And then to to lose their, you know, to, to lose their hair. I mean, yeah. obviously I shaved it and it was like, I think it was number two. But it was obviously, I still had it and it just looked like I had shaved hair. But, but it still obviously fell out. And I didn't, you know, I have got a bald head now, you know, well, a bit of fluff, but that's about it. But uh, so it, it's, it kind of got me ready for that next transition mm. as well. Mm. So Kind of a preparatory yeah, yeah. kind of path I guess you could say and yeah. then you just invest in some lovely headscarves and hats and that's what you do go, going forward and yes. just you know a get, girl does have her needs yes, yes. yes. so yeah. there's other ways of, you know of obviously like you can't do your hair in different styles but you can style your head in with different hats so yeah. you just try and turn it into a positive way for yourself mm-hmm. and did that sort of strength and and sort of um yeah I guess I guess yeah, strength. Did that sort of remain with you afterwards when you kind of got used to this new look, I no, guess, no, really? Yeah, it did. But then I still, when obviously the rest of the hair fell out and, you know, you catch, you for, you f- not you don't forget because your head's very sensitive and it will get and itchy and, and you go to touch your hair and you're like, oh, you, you know, yeah. you have no hair and you catch yourself maybe in the mirror. I mean, for, for a long time in the house, I was always wearing something on my head. I would let, wouldn't let anybody see me, as I call it, naked. But obviously okay, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, naked yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. And for my children especially, because I'd be thinking, oh, gosh, the last thing they want to see is mum with a bald head because it's a constant reminder. Because right. otherwise, if they're just seeing me as I am, I don't look ill. I don't look sick. But if they're seeing a bald head, then that's a reminder. But it's only really recently that we've had the conversations and the children like, it doesn't bother them. And my mum and dad, they come to visit, it doesn't bother them. They see me and hurt my head. It was just more the way I thought they might feel about seeing me. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But no, it doesn't. Re you know, it doesn't make them all really sad when they see me. They've, you know, they're going through the emotions anyway. But if I, I open the door, I mean, obviously, I don't open the door to the corpsman or the postman. I don't want to give them a shock, you know. Um, but I know, um, you know, my friends always see me with headwear. Like very, very rarely that I would take it off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I suppose if you were if you were to advise other women particularly about making such a move, um, would you have any words of recommendation or advice? Um, you know, having a done at a, I mean, you had a done at the hairdresser. You mm -hmm. knew the person very well. Uh, would, would there be any sort of words that you would kind of you know words of advice or recommendations you'd kind of pass on to them? Yeah, I I mean. I for me, I know it's always going to be a personal thing, but I think once you make the decision, if you decide, obviously, if you are going to hairdresser, obviously you don't want other people, customers around. I would do it privately within the hair salon, if your salon can right. organize that, yeah. or yeah. at home, and just have a few loved ones around you and try and make it a bit of a celebration as well. Like, you know, look at it as your next step, you know, your one step through your treatment, you're going, you know, it, everything Everything is day by day when you have cancer, yeah. you know, and you never know which day is going to bring, but try and make it a positive thing. And yeah. when are you ever going to shave all your hair off? You know, it's liberating and the feeling's amazing. Like, I love the feeling of the eraser going through the, the buzz. Like okay, it was, this, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, suppose, I suppose you're pairing it with something quite affirming. Yes. Really, you know, it's, it's it, like... The sadness of it is not the only show in town when you're actually doing it. It's it's you're pairing it with something quite positive with other people, Definitely. and the shared experience is often really. Um, it can it can, it can lighten it. It can give it some extra kind of meaning. It can, it's a shared thing. It's 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 a positive overall positive it can mm -hmm. be a positive experience. It, it, I think it gives you strength. I think having that extra having people around you, obviously <clears throat> when you seeing all your hair on the floor that mm -hmm. is hard as well yeah you yeah, know you yeah. know but the day I had it I'd like make, put makeup on I'll d dress up nice you know so when I see myself after it, it is a shock and then you mm. go home and then the next day you wake up and it's you, you know you're, you're forever touching your hair because you're not used to that sensation of your hair yeah, you know yeah. um but i can imagine for someone that has really long hair and spent you know you always had long hair it would be very tough you know yeah. to get used to that feeling of you know it's cold you, you've, you've got no hair it's cold on your head you're not used to that sensation um so it is it, it is a tough thing for people to go through but i would advise to take control and not to let you know day by day wake up with hair on your bed and in your shower and stuff i think it would just get you that one step further ahead in your mindset Rather than being a daily. proactive about yeah, it, and yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said for proactivity. I think it kind of certainly leads to kind of a sense of mastery or control or something like that. Yes, yeah, hundred percent. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it goes without saying, but for many, the diagnosis of disease is a huge <laughs> shock. Um, but for some, so, sometimes some people know in advance beforehand. They have a real intuition. Um, what was the moment for you that it all became real? Well, I had no idea. When you had no I, idea? No. So when I first went to the breast clinic, I kind of had been to the GP and just mentioned I had a little bit of pain in my right breast. But I, I thought it's hormones. I'm like, you know, it's getting to the you know, menopause age and, you know, there's changes in the body. And the doctor wasn't really concerned. So when I actually went to the breast clinic... I didn't really tell anybody. I just mentioned it to my sister or, you know, my parents. Didn't really say it to my friends and didn't take anyone with me because I thought it's it just going to go for a checkup. I'd been in 2018 and know what to expect, you yeah, know. Yeah, so yeah. I suppose if it's your first time, definitely take someone with you. But it wasn't my first time going into the breast clinic. Um, so I thought I can just, I'll just go in and just, to, you know, routine check and I'll be out the door and back to work but so obviously when I went in and obviously things was kind of come apparent as I was getting the mammogram and then they were saying a biopsy and I still was thinking well why do they want to do a biopsy 
what, why, you know, still didn't really catch on to. There was did you did you know what biopsy meant? Yes, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. But then okay. I thought, oh, why are you doing a biopsy? Because I don't think there was anything there, you know. And then they did a scan, and so one after obviously you're having all that done and you're going back into the room and yeah. even when I went in and there was the consultant, the doctor and a couple of nurses and I was thinking, why are all these people in here? Because last time I had this done, it wasn't, you know, I still really was not prepared for what the doctor was going to say. And then he'd said they'd found a lump and he'd, uh, you know, that that's what they've had done the biopsy and to come back in two weeks and talked about the cancer and then... I was like, okay, and then the nurse had said to me, do you understand what the doctor's saying? Because you you kind of, like, for me, it's like I'm looking at him in his mouth talking and, and there's words coming out, but I really don't know what any of this is. Why yeah. is he saying this to me? Because yeah, yeah, this yeah. isn't what I've come here for today. I've come here just to be sent home, say you're okay. So then he asked, would I like to ask any questions? And I was thinking, oh, I better ask something because they're going to be thinking... She doesn't know what's going on today. So I had my one question was, what do you think the chances are? This is going to be cancer. And he told me 99% straight away. So it was a big shock. And then, but I kept thinking, myself, well, still 1%. And do you know what? Sometimes I get it wrong and I won't know for two weeks. And, you know, two of the biopsies come back. But so I still was kind of, well, you know, when I left there, my sister happened to ring and I just said, oh, I think I've just had some bad news, but I, I, I don't really know. So she's like, go home. And she came up and we had a cup of tea and talked about it. And and I was still in my head, you know, it's not going to be bad news. And then as the time went on, as it got closer to the two weeks, and I obviously just told my parents I hadn't told anybody else. Um, and But when I went in that day for my results, I kind of expected him to, to say it you know, to say to me, but there was still that 1% in my head thinking, you know, they might say, actually, no, it's not, it's a cyst or there is, you know, there wasn't any cancer. And he just said, he'd said that, you know, it's just to confirm that it was, and you'll be coming in for an operator lumpectomy and explained, right. you know, would tailor your, your, um, you know, your, whatever you're going to have done to you, you know, um, your treatment towards you. And so, and trying to book it in, you know, and it just happened, everything happened really, really fast. So I still don't think at that stage it hits you. And I still feel at this stage, once you get your, once you're told you've got cancer, your tunnel vision, all you're thinking is, right, right I've got to get well, I've got to get through this. I don't think it's going to hit, and I don't think it's going to hit me until the end when everything's done. And I think that's when it will actually really, really hit me. Okay. That's not, that's actually found in the literature that mm. it's when the kind of dust settles, mm. particularly after everything is completed. Yes. Um, and then there's a bit of breathing space from the whole routine and rhythm of, of treatment. Mm -hmm. I think that's when people have, have a bit of space from it and then it begins to sink, as you say, sink in that actually yeah. what's, what's just happened. Um, I'm curious as well about how you let other people, loved ones in your in your in your family, in your in your circle. How did you let them know about what was happening to you? Well, was... um, on the the obviously day I got my results, my mom and my sister came with me, so they were with me to get right. the results, which I would totally recommend take someone with you because you don't think what to ask. You really don't take in the information. You need someone with you just to really help, you know, help you along the journey and to ask questions you might not think to ask. Um, so that really helped. And then I suppose for me, like it was obviously devastating for my parents to to see their, you know, I'm yeah. still their baby regardless yeah. of my yes. age. Yes. I'm 51 and I'm yes. still a baby to yes. them yes. Um, to get this diagnosis and... Yes you know, how are we going to get her through this? But obviously I've got three children. That was the hardest to, yeah. to break the news to them. One of mine was actually in New York at the time and I didn't want to tell him when he was away because then it was obviously going to be hard on him. Like he's only 20 and he'd be devastated and I don't know their understanding of cancer because it's scary, it's scary 
for someone to say they've got cancer because a lot of people just think, oh, it's associated is like obviously they're going to get really ill or they might die, you know, and you just mm. don't know what kind of how yeah. they... They may entertain just, the worst of yes. ideas. Yeah. And, you know, they're kind of, you know, have they... I suppose they haven't really... They don't know anyone that's gone through cancer or had cancer really and what what's the prognosis? How will this work for my mum? Um, so I didn't... I told my oldest and kind of broke it to her gently to say that I getting tests and I don't know if I have it just to kind of drip feed her in a way yeah, yeah. Um, and just gently kind of and then I didn't tell my youngest son because if I tell him, if I told him it would have gone to his friends and it would have gone to my old my other son in America right, so I yeah. just kept it quiet and then I actually had my I was having my operation on 17th of April that was the day he was flying back from New York just so happened it was the day he was coming back so it was a Friday that I told both my sons. At that stage, I'd known a month, month anyway. Okay. But it was because it was just, um, he, you know, I want, didn't want it to be a shock when he was arriving back that day that I was going into my operation. And obviously then I wanted to start preparing them because at that stage, I just, I didn't know it was just an operation and whether I was having any more treatment because obviously everybody's diagnosis and their treatment's going to be different. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was... Um, really tough on the boys like, and, and well well the three of them you know and then telling my friends I think was really tough as well because they know me as Lisa who loves sports and and I didn't look ill you know I was still yeah, climbing yeah. Errigal like every Saturday I'd be climbing a mountain and doing things I wasn't ill I wasn't sick I didn't look ill and then all of a sudden I'm given this news and they're like, well, how can you be, how can you have cancer? Because... It's baffling. Yeah. Like, sometimes, like, and I would be the same, if I thought, oh, someone's had a cancer, I'd be thinking, oh, they've lost a lot of weight, they start looking ill, you know. And obviously I didn't have any of that. I didn't know. And you, mm. and I wouldn't have known if I had, mm. obviously hadn't gone for a breast check at that time. And um, mm-hmm. it was just pure chance by luck that the doctor had referred me on, that I'd mentioned it in an appointment. Right. You know, so yeah. I could have been sitting for months not knowing, you know, and f- feeling fine. You know, it's not everybody that kind of gets cancer is going to start feeling ill. They could have it for, it a, a, you know, quiet. for un- quiet for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Like my consultant thinks it's probably I'd had it for six months at that stage. So right, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. and okay. I had no no, no ill, you know, yeah. no like I say, energy levels are fine. I was still doing everything. You know, yeah. going to work every day, doing my normal job. So, yeah. it, obviously, then it, everything happens so quick. You know, when you got your diagnosis and then your, you know, your treatment plan. It's and for them, obviously, it was you didn't have time to get over the shock as well. So now that you're um, going through treatment. Um, has the process matched your expectations or fears or apprehensions or has it been easier than you thought it might be? Or I think n- nothing can really prepare you for how things are going to be. Because mm-hmm. um, you don't ever think about how will I, if I get cancer, how will I deal with it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I have to say the hospital has been fantastic. This, the good, good. doctors and nurses... Um, fantastic care and they're there with you every step of the way um so i had a lumpectomy and then i had my lymph nodes removed so i had two operations i was hoping that i wouldn't have chemo i think that was my biggest fear the operations didn't scare me but the thought of chemo because i don't even like taking a paracetamol (laughs) you know let alone thinking what's these chemicals that are going to have to go through my system but you just all you think about is that you want to live and that's what it's about yeah. i'll take whatever it i have to have because i want to live for my you know for my children for my family for my friends i want to be here i want to have a future um but it is tough you know uh, chemo is very tough on the body and i don't think anything can prepare you even all the literature that you get given to you know and um to kind of let you know what to expect and the side effects but I still found it very hard and 
I thought I would <laughs> I thought I'd sail through this in my head because right, I thought, okay. you know, I'm strong, I'm fit, I've been healthy, this you know, I'll mm. just fly through this. But no, it did kind of knock me back and I said, mm. Oh no, it isn't. But I think it was just every take each day and everybody always says, Take each day at a time and I really get that. Yeah. You know, yeah. you it's really, a one day at a time process. Definitely. You can't yeah. plan ahead. You know, sometimes I might plan to meet a friend's or to do something, and then I have to cancel because I'm just not well enough that day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I find it very... And that's entirely normal. Yeah, yeah. And I find it hard, the energy levels, yeah. because I'm always so energetic, and then the fact that I can get up and get showered and dressed, and that's me for the day, and I found that frustrating as well, mm. because I'm not someone that sits around and and does nothing it's not that I'm doing anything but I just had to find other ways to occupy myself um and I, I would just have to kind of say to myself you know it's you're resting you're not wasting the day because I always feel like oh, I've done nothing today I've not achieved anything but I'm not I'm resting so you've really got to change your mindset you know and yeah. start it's doing the, different it's things the, it's a it's a silent but sacred work recovering Yes. And your body actually really needs that. Yeah. So even when you're sitting there and you're feeling like you're not doing anything, your body is working very, very hard to recuperate and replenish itself. So that can't be dismissed. That's a that's as I mm. say, it's a it's a silent but very sacred work. I think on the on the inside. I think. And you learn as you go along. Like I learned the hard ways a few times because I would have done too much and burnt myself out, <coughs> and oh, then okay. suffered. Yeah. The boom and bust idea. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I was very guilty of doing that for quite a few times. Okay. Yeah, um, and then... Experience teaches you, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Keeps it to your school in that sense. That's yeah. right, oh, yeah. 100%. And yeah. now, um, obviously, you know, it's and it's so long, you know, and yeah. you, because my chemo is every two weeks, you live your life in two-week cycles. <laughs> You know, you'd have a bad week and then you'd have a good week. And, I, you know, yeah, on your, when you're yeah. f- feeling a little better, you know, meet friends for lunch or just plan nice to do nice things, to have things to look forward to. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of something that I would do, like, and have something to look forward to rather than I'm in the house. And, you know, I'd never sit in the house before this. I'd be out every single day and... So I've got to enjoy actually being home and reading books, listening to music, listening to podcasts. You know, so yes, let me watching this. Listen to this back today. Yes, <laughs> and like, oh, like, <laughs> so saying, you, you just find different things, you know, to, that you enjoy, and mm. it's good because you do have to reset. You do yeah. sort of. It's like my life, so it has always been go go go, yes. and now it's I've had to stop and pause and yes. actually look at my life and think what 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 do I enjoy doing what do I really want to do yeah you know it's like what do I want to be when I get older <laughs> I suppose there's slightly more existential questions you have space in your mind to be able to entertain in a way that perhaps yeah. busyness kind of gets in the way of asking before really you wouldn't be certainly the first person to yeah. have questions like that. Yeah. I think for me, like, I've like been working in a preschool for 10 years, managing it. I have, like, 38 children I'd look after with, with all the stuff. And I was convinced, like, they would, you know, no one could do this job, only me. And that was the hard part because then when, obviously, then I knew I was finishing up because I was going for my operations and then on for treatment... And I was like, oh, they're never going to manage without me. And I found that as a really shock that they did. And I didn't mean, I don't mean it in a bad way mm-hmm, that they mm-hmm. can, because they're fully capable and, I, and of course they can. And I'm delighted to see. But I felt, felt like, oh, why, how can they manage without me? You know, I don't want them to. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, I want to it's be a bit of needed. A of humility, really. In yeah, yeah. I, I like. Yeah. It's hard not to feel that I'm not needed anymore, and mm. I found that tough. You know, yeah. and then it was actually. It, it's not that I'm not needed. They can manage about me. It was just because that's what I've been doing for years and years. And you know, you you always think like um, you're not replaceable, but everybody is. But it's not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. So that that's a, another lesson that I've learned. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Um, 
is there anything on your heart or in your mind that you'd like to communicate to other people who would be on this would be journey set of circumstances is there anything that you would you would say to to those people beginning or in the middle of it that might be helpful well i think it was said to me a lot at the beginning about self-care self-care and i was like okay what's this self-care so yeah a lot of people are saying to me about self-care the importance of self-care and I suppose when you're going through your daily life, how many people are taking notice of self-care to themselves? You're lucky if you get 10 minutes in bed to read a book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the number one piece of advice I would give to anybody going through, starting a journey, really pay attention to your self-care. And it's not like you're being selfish, or but you have to concentrate on yourself. You know, it's very hard to get over, um, I suppose you feel guilty because... Like some days if I couldn't make dinner for or do things, it, it really doesn't matter. Everybody will manage. No one's going to die of hunger, you know. Just concentrate on the way you are and the way you're feeling and just deal with that every day, you know. I kind of, when I wake up in the morning, I get up and I get showered and I'll sit and i would be like, how am I feeling? What do I feel I can manage today? Yeah, then yeah. I might prioritise like two or three things I actually would like to achieve in this day. And I'd write it down. And if I even just do one, that's good. It's a positive thing. Um, you know, because you don't want to get to the stage where that you are lying around too much because you do need to kind of motivate yourself, you know, as well, because yeah. it doesn't help you just lying in bed or, you know, if you can get up, get dressed every day. If you can get out for a walk, even a drive, get someone to take you, you know, go yeah. to the beach, yeah. you know, yeah. fresh yeah. air yeah. is fantastic. I used to run. Obviously, I, I'm not able to do that anymore. And I've, re I've missed that. So it's like, what can I do to feel that now? That feeling. So walking, going to the beach, just looking at the waves. Um, meditation. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Started meditation. And just also the reflexology that I'm obviously having here at yep. Cancer Care West has been fantastic. Has really, really good. helped me on my journey. Good. Um, good. I would come in here and barely just get out, call out the car and get up the stairs and get in here. <laughs> I'd always make myself come up the stairs, and I would be at the door and I was thinking, oh, I just don't know if I can get through this. And then after the session, I just feel like a different person. Like it's the, you know, try different alternative therapies. You know, yeah. Reiki, reflexology, meditation. You know, take that. Take this time to try these things that you've never tried because it really yeah. does help. Yeah, you know? I think that's a, that's really good because a, a veil of help. Yes, it's because it's out there. Yes, um, and some people are reluctant, but but I think you're. you're it, it's hard to ask for help. You know, when you're so independent, and yeah. I'm still guilty of that. Yeah. You know, when you just be like, like even cutting the grass. Like sometimes I get the lawnmower out to cut the grass. I don't have to because my, you know people there that can cut the grass, but. I'm like, I'm independent, but I, I've, you know, you have to ask, you know, it doesn't make you a weak person, you know, don't be frightened to ask because the big thing for people around you, they just want to help and, and that makes them feel better that they're doing something for you. And like my dad would take me shopping every week, even I can manage it myself, but he just, that's his thing that mm -hmm. he's doing mm -hmm. for me and mm -hmm. he's helping and he feels that's helping me in my journey, you know. Mm -hmm. So let people help because it, it's, they want to be involved in your journey. And even though it is, you know, an individual thing and it is a lonely process, regardless when you do have people, you, you still feel lonely because you, you think they're not going to understand, but there's groups, there's places you can go, you know, to even come here and to discuss, you know, about how you're feeling because you don't have to be alone, you know, yeah. which is, I think, is a big message for people because I think loneliness throughout the cancer journey, it would be a, probably a, a really big thing. Interestingly, you've just mentioned the strap line on our sign outside that mm. you don't have to go through this alone, really. And uh, maybe that's the that's the moment to actually maybe bring this conversation, this podcast, to a, a conclusion. Yeah, um, if that's if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. No, perfect. Thank you so much. So, Lisa, thanks ever so much uh, for joining us 
um, and speaking so openly and candidly and uh, informatively as well about uh, your experience and your recommendation. So uh, we really hope that people will will gain something from this. Um, so I think that's about it for from uh, Lisa and I and from Cancer Care West for the time being. Um, Hopefully this will be of interest and of note to yourselves and, and keep a keep a look out on, on social media for our next one, which I hope won't be uh, too far in the future. So thanks ever so much for joining us and uh, see you soon.